just I'll just wait on Heidi. Perfect. Well, I am now that we have Heidi with us, we have double Heidi with us, which is even better than single <laughs> Heidi. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get us started. Uh, two Heidi's are better than one. Um, That's okay. terrifying. <laughs> Thank you all so much for um for, for, for all of today, but especially for staying for the last clearly going to be the best panel of the day, uh, where we are going to obviously talk about the topic at issue, but I think we're all going to try to incorporate some of the themes and lessons of the day so that we also use this space as a bit of a, uh, a wrap up space. Um, and to that end, I will endeavor to leave a good amount of time for oh. audience questions. Um, and so I would I would love uh, your your comments and questions uh, towards the end. Uh, so very briefly, I'm not going to go into their bios. They're all esteemed, excellent researchers, scholars, professors, but we have Heidi Katrasser on the screen. Um, uh, we have, I'm going to do it, Artur Pericles Lima Monteiro, excellent. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, and Joseph uh, Usinski uh, all here today. Um, and the general format, you guys know it by now, I'm going to ask them to briefly summarize their, their research for, for this work. Uh, I'm going to engage them with a couple questions, uh, then engage all of them with some general themes that uh, go across all three of their, uh, of their papers, uh, and then open it up. So a lot of today has been focused on what the law can and cannot do to address the uh, scourge of lies, or if you're Alan, maybe the, 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 the beauty of lies, uh, and, and, and the place for, for law in our constitutional scheme. Uh, that's still relevant, of course, to our final panel, but I think here what we really want to do is take a step back and not just be lawyers and law professors and think about only what the law can do to address the societal problem, but about how the law can support other uh, sociological, technological, political solutions to the situation we find ourselves in. Um, so uh, we have papers that focus on knowledge producers, uh, papers that focus on uh, anonymity in spaces online in particular, um, and a paper that focuses on um, how the role of political leaders in returning to a norm of truthfulness. Um, and so the, the real questions on the table are, are what sociological conditions, what technological innovations, what uh, political factors, what uh, institutional changes uh, do we need to be going for here? And, and where can the law not necessarily be at the forefront, but be a supporting uh, force in, these, uh, in this progress? So I'm going to start with Joseph. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking just a couple minutes to introduce your own work, uh, and then I can ask you a question or two. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the Knight Institute and to the organizers for asking uh, Adam and I to uh, write and present this paper. Um, it's been a wonderful program thus far, and uh, so thank you. Um, the focus of the paper is on conspiracy theories because that's what Adam and I do, and that's all I do. I think there are bigger questions to be had about misinformation and disinformation and fake news and various other things, but um, I'll stick with what I'm good at for now, um, and, uh, but I will point out that some of the claims I make about conspiracy theories probably equally apply to misinformation and disinformation and whatnot, particularly epistemological concerns. Um, some of what I'm going to say very quickly is going to come off a little bit dogmatic, but I will say I've been polling on these things for a decade now. I've got a pretty good grip on what people believe and what they don't and why and um, how and if they act on it. And I have a lot of those papers published, but a lot of the underlying data that I might mention here is actually posted right on the front of my website. So you can um, uh, check my numbers if you want to. Um, so uh, so there is a big assumption right now that uh, exposure to a particular piece of information leads people to immediately adopt a belief, and then that leads people to engage in behaviors. Uh, 
And there seems to be, this seems to be the conception that is undergirding a lot of our discussion about how to regulate social media. So for example, when asked, um, you know, what does he want to tell Facebook? President Biden said, they're killing people, implying that people go to Facebook, they see anti-vax stuff, they refuse to get the vaccine, so they've taken action, now they die because they catch COVID and are unvaccinated. Um, now, the conception seems to be something like exposure is going way up because of social media, everyone's seeing conspiracy theories more and more, uh, therefore beliefs must be going up too, and there's an assumption that conspiracy theory driven behaviors, whatever those might be, are on the rise as well. Um, but. <laughs> I mean, despite this being a popular narrative, and I will say that 70% of Americans buy into this when we ask them in polls, they think conspiracy theories are more believed now, and uh, a majority of those people think that social media is to blame for it. But when you look at the data measuring these beliefs, it's not clear that that's the case at all. It's not clear that beliefs and conspiracy theories have gone up in the last six decades. It's not clear that we are now in the golden age of conspiracy theories. I get this claim thrown at me quite a bit and they say now is the time, but I say worse than when we were drowning and crushing women for supposedly conspiring with Satan, worse than the Red Scare? I mean, really worse than those things right now? I mean, we could certainly make the case if we wanted to, but it's not at all clear. And certainly when we try to measure beliefs, we're not finding increases. It's not clear that uh, conspiracy theories and misinformation are more prevalent in our information environment. Certainly it's easy to get, but so is true information. And there's a lot of true information out there too. And it's not clear that people are acting on these ideas more. I mean, often we focus on a handful of shocking events, say, oh my God, you know, the world's going down the, down the tubes and everyone's acting on these ideas. But in terms of a general trend, it's sort of hard to, to, to make that case. So I'll give you just some specific examples. I mean, the big claim in 2020, um, one of them was that QAnon is big and getting bigger. And it was the worst polls that got the most fantastic results showing the half the country became QAnon, shockingly. If everyone, if that was true, 8chan would have exploded because there would have been too many people to be on it. Um, having polled it throughout the last four years now, around 5% of Americans, and that makes it one of the least believed conspiracy theories I poll on. To put that in context, Kennedy beliefs are around 55%. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the media said that COVID conspiracy theories were on the rise and spreading everywhere because of social media, and the pandemic video was partially responsible. I polled initially in the first couple of weeks of March on a couple of COVID conspiracy theories, then re-polled in June, and then October, and then May of 2021, flat, flat, flat. And even pieces of misinformation that have popped up, we polled on repeatedly, flat, no increases. And the expectation would have been that all of these things should have been going through the roof because as a social scientist, you know, it'd be neat if I could have done the, the pandemic and say, I want to get people to believe in conspiracy theories and see what works. I'm going to crank every dial to 11 and see what happens. I'm going to put it on social media. I'm going to make everyone lose their job, tank the economy and scare the heck out of them with a deadly pandemic. Every dial's to 11. Flat, right? So either people were going to buy into these ideas because of who they were or they weren't. And outside of those two critical cases, I've polled on about 40 other conspiracy theories just recently, repeating polls that have been done in the last six decades um, from the Roper archive. The vast majority of them stayed flat over the course of however long I had been, how, during the space between when they were first polled and now, and um, almost as many went down by significant percentages. And only a handful had gone up and not the ones that people are running around worried about. So 
what we argue in our paper is that we have to meet two things if we really want to do something about conspiracy theories, and this partially applies to misinformation too, is that one, we have to be able to define conspiracy theory so that any legislation on it doesn't um, ensnare any sort of idea. We have to be able to define it. And that's really hard to do. I've been working on, on this topic for 15 years. No one agrees with my definition. Even the other people who all they do is study definitions. We can't get along seemingly. Why? I mean, part of it is a substantive thing. Like, are you alleging a conspiracy? The other part is an epistemological question which can't really be solved. And that is, what is the standard to say something's a conspiracy theory or not? So a good example of this is if I say, you know, Clinton conspired with Russia, is it a conspiracy theory? People say, yeah, clearly. If I say Trump conspired with Russia, is that a, con no. And the question is, well, why not? It's the same sentence, different noun. You know, so in this is, this is more complicated by human psychology because to each of us who believes conspiracy theories, not me, all of you. And we all point the finger. I need, I'm going to let you get to two, but one of my questions is actually on one. So can I, can I just, pre, uh, I want you to go deeper just for a second on, on this de definitional problem. Um, I, 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 I'm with you and I think you, you lay it out well in the first part of the draft here that uh, the, it, the, 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 the lines of what is conspiracy, what is not, it's just so wide, so murky, we can't agree that you know, your first condition isn't satisfied. But my question for you as, as you're thinking about this is when you're making that point, you, you, you seem to be thinking about conspiracy in a very, you know, wide sense, but later on when you're, when you're, you're going to get to part two, but later on, when you're thinking through the value of not regulating conspiracy or right, the value of having that knowledge uh, out there, um, it seems to me in your, in your research or in your writing that you actually have a very specific type of conspiracy in mind. And it's a conspiracy about what ha what is ha what happened what has happened and it's usually about around a powerful individual so the example you just gave that whether it's clinton or trump it's still the same type of conspiracy which is like what did some powerful actor do that is hidden mm -hmm. and that that's sort of the the the, the trope and i'm wondering even if, if, if i'm wondering if your logic is really connected to that specific type of conspiracy or um how much does it apply to to more general conspiracies about which you know what we might call hate conspiracies right that certain races are inferior right certain um genders are inferior uh so not so much about what has happened but how things are or not so much about like a historical or a scientific truth you know does the vaccine work or not was the coronavirus made in a lab or or at a um, you know, at a market uh, uh, versus sort of a more generalized social truth about how we operate a as a society together, right? So conspiracies about powerful individuals or conspiracies about powerless communities. Um, can you just touch on a de the definitional problem there? Of, does everything apply equally or do you really have one model of conspiracy theory in mind? Yeah, well, the, the definitional problem with conspiracy theories applies to conspiracy theory. So the examples you gave, like this race is, inherently whatever, you know, something like that. Now you're just engaging in racist, probably untrue and falsifiable claims, mm -hmm. right? The problem with the conspiracy theory is that we are making an argument about something that's happening when we're not looking. And the assumption is that it can't really be proven because a lack of evidence is proof of the conspiracy. Why? Because of course the conspirators are hiding their tracks and throwing out red herrings to, to make it look like it's not happening, right? And then you add on top of that, the fact that people can um, add and change the conspiracy theory to adapt to any new evidence. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama doesn't have a birth certificate and that shows that he was born in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he doesn't have a long form birth certificate and that proves that he was born in Kenya. Oh, the long form birth certificate he has and just showed us is a forgery. 
And that proves that he was born in Kenya. So you can never really get around these sorts of things because undergirding the conspiracy theories that something is happening in secret that can't be fully evidenced, right? So that's the a falsifiability issue that constantly plagues this. Then you get into an issue where just no one really agrees on why do we call Watergate a conspiracy, but the idea that Bush blew up the Twin Towers a conspiracy theory? Mm -hmm. What's the epistemological bar, right? We all know there's one, but we're oftentimes, I ask people this, they don't know exactly what it is. And even if they have a bar for that particular conspiracy theory, it's highly unlikely that they apply it evenly to every other conspiracy theory that they run into. And this is part of the human psychology issue where, oh, well, it's accusing the other guy, well, lower bar. <laughs> so it must be true. Accusing me, higher bar, that's a conspiracy theory. And politicians are really good at that, right? Um, so, so that's sort of the epistemological issue there. And it gets, you know, once you start getting into this, it gets even worse than what I've said. Um, but the second part that I'll move on to is that it's very difficult to demonstrate the causal impact of a particular belief on behaviors. I mean, yes, people do act on their beliefs, but oftentimes they don't, right? So I'll, I'll mention a, a very recent and very tragic case. A, a, a guy in California took his kids to uh, the Mexico border and killed them with a sword because he believed that they were lizard people. They had, he thought they had lizard DNA and he had been into QAnon and reptilian elite conspiracy theories and a whole bunch of other ideas. So I've been getting asked by the media quite a bit, you know, these ideas are so dangerous. And I said, well, first of all, most people who buy into this stuff don't act on it in any way. And second of all, if you look at all the other motivations that this person had and everything else that they were saying and doing, which show clear signs of paranoia and schizophrenia. He thought he was Neo from the movie, The Matrix. He, he thought that everyone was out to get him. He was seeing signs and patterns everywhere. Um, so in this case, we're probably more likely talking about mental illness than just, oh, I happen to slip on a banana peel, see a belief and then go act on it in some very deleterious way. And this is the same thing with the January 6th folks. I mean, yes, they were probably true believers, but that guy didn't buy the horns and the furs and the face paint that morning because he was convinced of something. He was wearing that outfit for years. And I won't repeat what his lawyer said about him because it's fairly offensive, but it was something, you know, he doesn't have a great mental capacity and his political views are all over the place and his worldviews are sort of strange. Um, so just tying that link between beliefs and behaviors is very difficult. And oftentimes there's a whole lot of other things going on in there, right? So when we say the big lie, yeah, lots of Republicans believe it, but how come Democrats don't? Because it doesn't favor them and they resist it. Um, and why didn't Democrats act on it? Because they don't believe it. But what about Republicans? Why do they believe it? Because they got it from a trusted source. The president of the United States, and the media they watch, and the sen senators and representatives. Um, so that's their entire information environment of people that they trust. Now, did all of them go and storm the Capitol? No, most were at home or at work or sending their kids to school on January 6th, right? But it was a small number who did. And um, I will just throw a guess out there that, that those folks who probably did the most damage on that day have a bunch of other factors that were driving them to act the way they did too. Um, that's great. I'm, I have so many more questions, including even, um, and just put a pin in this, um, what are the harms that we care about? So I think in many of the examples you're using, we're thinking about more, more violent 
and overt harms. Um, but to return to you know, sort of like Deborah's paper from earlier, are there are there just democracy harms to that that are sufficient, even if people aren't acting in a violent way? Do we still care that this type of conspiratorial um, influence is out there and sowing distrust in our in our democracy? So I I'm going to force us to to go on to the other two papers, but um, put a pin in that as we as we continue to explore. I was going to do art next, but actually where we ended, I want to kick it to Heidi if we can, because um, you ended on the people we trust. Uh, and, and we're getting information from those whom we trust. And I think that segues really nicely into Heidi's work um, on, on knowledge producers. And uh, so if, if we have Heidi, uh, perfect. Yes, Heidi, can yes. I take it to you for a couple minute summary of, of your, your piece? Absolutely. And can everyone hear me? Yes. I, okay, great, thanks. Um, so first of all, big thank you to everyone, uh, uh, to Francesca for moderating this panel, to uh, Katie and Genevieve and uh, the other staff. Um, I also have to say a very special thank you uh, to Candice and the other uh, video and audio production folks for making it possible um, for me to uh, be here virtually. I don't know uh, if any of you noticed, that, uh, as, as Francesca was introducing people, you might have seen me on the video screen frantically on the phone. I swear I wasn't just gossiping with a friend. I was uh, actually frantically uh, talking to Candace because I had screwed something up on my end and she walked me through it. Um, so thanks to everyone. Okay, I'm gonna set a timer because I am not very disciplined and I'm gonna try to keep this to about five minutes. So, uh, so it's- You're every moderator's time. dream, Heidi. <laughs> yes, well, well, we'll see if I keep going when the little thing, uh, when the little thing starts uh, trilling. Um, but anyway, so I'll try to keep this to five minutes and uh, uh, just to kind of introduce uh, some of the key concepts uh, that I'm getting at and then um, look forward to, to some robust discussion with everyone. Um, okay, so first, my topic of focus, um, you know, Francesca just kind of led into this so beautifully by saying that um, uh, my topic relates to the question of who do we trust, right? Um, and, and of course, this has been a big theme throughout the day, perhaps especially in the first panel. Um, what kind of trustworthy information sources are there? Are there ways that we as a society uh, can help cultivate them? Um, and I actually think, and, and we heard about this somewhat in the first panel too, I think especially from Sam, um, that the government has a potentially, albeit you know, it's, it's a dangerous area, but a potentially uh, fruitful, important, constructive role to play um, in helping to produce um, reliable information and expertise. And um, in particular, I focus in the paper, which right now is a very rough draft, um, but which I'm, I'm uh, uh, updating. Um, I focus on what I refer to as public knowledge producers. Um, and I define that as those uh, who in their capacity as uh, either public employees or entities or subsidy recipients uh, play a significant role in that capacity um, in providing or uh, conveying information or otherwise in fostering knowledge. Um, now, the, the next thing that I want to uh, make very clear is that I am by no means uh, claiming that this is a novel area of focus um, because I think the larger conversation is very important in addition to just giving credit where credit's due. Um, I want to note that this is part of, uh, you know, certainly part of a larger discussion and in particular of late. Um, given what's going on in the world, given the uh, perception that our kind of shared epistemic foundation is at risk, um, increasingly this has been something that folks have looked at. Vicki Jackson um, at Harvard has uh, 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 begun looking at this in a way that most closely tracks what I'm doing and that she's taking a trans-substantive look at different knowledge institutions. Um, we've also seen folks in the communications field, um, I'm thinking especially of uh, Victor Picard talking about the role of public journalism. Um, and, and again, just this morning, right, we saw uh, Sam and um, uh, Sam and John uh, and, and others today talking about the possible role of sort of government um, in, in fostering knowledge and even critical thinking. Um, now, all of this, though, um, of course, generates a question and a worry, um, which I think was nicely encapsulated by the question Eugene asked um, at the end of the first panel today, um, which was, okay, but so we have these government institutions, 
how do they determine truth, right? Um, why do we trust them? How do we set that up so that they are trustworthy? Um, and, you know, that, that, is a, that is a sort of a real, of course, that's, you know, that's, that's a conundrum. Um, but I start by noting that we don't have to hypothesize here. Um, you know, part of the project I'm undertaking and that others, particularly Vicki Jackson, are, are simultaneously undertaking um, involves kind of canvassing the existing landscape and recognizing and identifying and kind of examining more our existing knowledge producers and institutions, including as I focus on here, our public knowledge institutions. Um, and indeed, you know, we already have a number of sort of government uh, science agencies, um, uh, even public journalism, uh, publicly subsidized journalism, most notably NPR, uh, PBS, um, various individuals uh, in the civil service, for example, um, who are hired <clears throat> precisely for their expertise um, and toward the end, predominant end of, of uh, producing knowledge. Um, and so what I want to talk about, and I see, I'm now regretting, I said five minutes, I'm, I, I see time's running quickly. Um, so to try to keep myself honest, I may go a little above five minutes, but I'll try to very much summarize the, the rest of what I wanted to say in the next minute or two. Um, and that is to say that um, I think it, through these existing institutions and among other things, judicial uh, responses to them, we actually have some tools to work with that I think uh, uh, with some success, um, try to sort of foster reliability through the harnessing of disciplinary norms, and in particular through maintaining a degree of political independence for those in those roles. Um, and there's so much that can be said here. I'm basically at five minutes. So let me just note um, sort of two areas of judicial doctrine that um, uh, try to sort of navigate this, this difficult terrain. Um, one is, and, and I should note at the outset, uh, what I'm about to say, I'm sure will generate thoughts in many of, well, okay, but there's a lot of contrary case law too. Um, I'll get to that, I'll be it, try to do it very quickly. Um, so, on the plus side, in my view, right, what are the areas of case law that um, actually manage to sort of protect the um, uh, independent expertise of some of our existing uh, knowledge producers, public knowledge producers? Um, well, one is that realm of First Amendment doctrine that recognizes some degree of protection um, for government employees for their speech. Um, and uh, in particular, the court, including in 2014 in Lane v. Franks, has noted on a few occasions that one of the reasons public knowledge or that public employees uh, need such protection is because of the value they bring by virtue of their unique expertise. We also see glimmers of um, an approach that I like to think of as kind of a binding, the government binding itself to the mask, uh, mask, sorry, uh, type of doctrine. We see hints of this in public forum doctrine in cases of, uh, like legal services v. Velasquez, uh, where the court has suggested that, look, where the government purports to subsidize or um, create a type of institution, it's bound by sort of the disciplinary norms um, of that institution. I'm, I'm somewhat overstating what the doctrine actually says, so I, I'm happy to elaborate, but I think we have doctrine that can be read that way. Um, now, one of the big focuses of my paper are threats, ongoing threats to those knowledge institutions. Um, and I I will keep myself pretty honest on time. So let me just say two quick things about that. And I can elaborate later if people want. Um, one uh, set of threats come in the case law themselves, right? So Garcetti, um, as I'm happy to elaborate on it, it's probably everyone here knows, um, uh, uh, substantially limited, uh, not just public employee speech protections generally, but especially um, the ability of public employees to be protected when they're acting in their uh, professional capacity, which I would argue is the time when they're most likely to be harnessing their disciplinary expertise. Um, also, outside of the First Amendment realm, uh, unitary executive theory, um, I think, poses an increasing risk to the uh, viability of things like civil service protections and uh, other ways of trying to um, enforce some degree of disciplinary expertise protection for that within the administrative state. I also talk in the draft about, um, uh, I sort of tie these uh, judicial trends 
to cultural and political threats um, to these knowledge institutions. But in the interest of time, and I've already gone longer than I said I would, I, I will stop here, but I look forward to the discussion. Let, let, let me stay with you anyways, Heidi, because I, I, again, I want to put sort of a general question on the table for you um, before turning to art and then engaging in a, in a bigger discussion, all three of us, all three of you. Um, I, I want you to explain the difference between the anti-distortion principle that you are identifying and what could be seen as an anti-deception principle. At times in your draft, it seems like the thing you care more about or that the case law cares more about um, is not so much whether there is government distortion of the message, but whether there is a deception that it is the government speaking, that it is a government actor behind um, the content of this public broadcast or the curriculum in our schools, uh, et cetera. Uh, so what is the anti-distortion principle doing that is different apart and maybe beyond uh, what an anti-deception principle would do? Yeah, that's a terrific question. So let me, I guess, to um, uh, sort of put that question in a larger context of what I think public institution, uh, public knowledge institutions um, can do and the ways in which I think uh, um, the law to some degree does and certainly should protect them. Um, I think that, 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 that public knowledge institutions with, a, uh, with some protections built in for disciplinary expertise and for sort of self, a degree of self-government by experts um, with some insulation from certainly pure partisan politics. Um, the idea is through that, not to necessarily come up with, with right answers all the time, um, uh, in part because, you know, people make mistakes as we've talked about throughout, um, whether they're doing it, whether their motivations are partisan or, um, you know, or, or uh, otherwise, or just, you know, protecting a pet project. Um, in addition, and here I, a quick shout out to uh, uh, Mark Tushnet's new paper that I just read yesterday with great interest. It's really interesting, the paper focusing on COVID-19, as Mark um, uh, emphasizes throughout, science doesn't always have clearly right and wrong answers, just to take science as one discipline. Um, and even when it does, sometimes that's, you know, that shifts over time. Um, and one problem with the way, um, and I, I have long thought that one problem with the way both administrations have handled COVID-19 is almost a fear, kind of a distrust of the public, um, a fear of communicating to them that science doesn't always mean there's one clear answer, right? So this is all a long way of saying that I think what public and knowledge institutions can do that is most important is not necessarily give us all like arithmetically correct answers, because oftentimes those don't exist or the knowledge may change, but to provide a public space and a public sort of subsidized space for these questions to be worked out um, through processes of disciplinary expertise. And also some public knowledge institutions like certainly universities. Um, and I would also say, although this is more complicated, K through 12 public schools as well, play a role in fostering not just knowledge, but critical thinking so that people develop media literacy and the ability to figure these things out for themselves. So how that relates to uh, your specific question, Francesca, is that I think it's, it's very important that um, public knowledge institutions themselves not become vehicles for deceiving uh, audiences, um, especially for deceiving the American people, um, by harnessing, or I should say hijacking might be the better word, um, the prestige and the perceived independence that comes with expertise um, while really feeding government scientists, government educators, whatever the case may be, what's really a kind of political message. And here, by the way, I have to give one more shout out. Helen Norton um, has also written uh, uh, beautifully on this topic. I'm thinking especially of her 2009 uh, Duke Law Review piece, where I think she might have been the first in that piece. Um, and then I, I've tried to build on it. Um, uh, Helen uh, herself drew an important distinction between um, public employee, public employment that involves essentially what you may call scripted speech versus public employment 
uh, you know, just conveying the government's message versus public employment that entails independent uh, judgment. Um, so I'm, I, you're, so you're right, Francesca, that I'm more focused on that as a means of discovering what we might kind of grandly call truth that I am of public knowledge institutions as vehicles for always kind of spitting out an indisputably correct answer. That's great. Um, that's great. And the, and the, the pin I want to put in, in your research before turning to art is, um, is to talk about, uh, K, you know, K, K through 12 schools more. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the, the point of today is really to think about how do we get people to believe in truth and to not believe in, 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 a, in a false conception of our, our democracy, but also the world at large. And um, the role of schools has obviously got to play such an important role in that. And I think you start to address it in your paper. Um, would love to hear more about that as we uh, continue on. All right, I'm gonna ask you to quickly summarize your uh, research next. Thank you, Francesca. And I'll try to uh, make up for my enormous name by keeping this to under <laughs> five minutes. Uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you to, to Kate and Kitty and Genevieve. Uh, everything has been so great and you even fixed the weather. So thank you. I'm so fortunate that I'm here with you and have listened to your enriching and, and insightful comments. So uh, I, I, so I think that when we think about anonymity, our assumptions have been that anonymity is so focused uh, uh, with speaker rights and suppression of speech. And I want to say that it's about more than that. So I, I think anonymity and identification have been thought of as if anonymity uh, necessarily released speakers from, from social norms, including truth preserving norms, obviously the theme of our panel, uh, with identification driving the precise opposite. And my paper argues that that's too simplistic a view of both anonymity and identification. And I only came to that realization very late in the seven years that I've been pursuing this project. Uh, to put it shortly, in a highly polarized social media, it seems fair to say that truth isn't something partisans, real names or not, will value above their allegiances. Uh, what's more, identification forces users to perform their identities in a context collapse world. Now I'm borrowing here this term from uh, uh, Alice Mar Marwick and Dana Boyd. And they point out how uh, in a context collapse world, uh, users are like micro celebrities broadcasting into an ether uh, with no clear bound boundaries uh, of audiences. Uh, uh, or norms. So when you look at the evidence showing that identification is sometimes associated with content we're concerned about, and this is misinformation, hate, hate speech, etc., I want to emphasize that that is a function of identification. Partisans pay a heavy price for challenging their leaders, their rhetoric, and lies because they are identified. It's a component of what the social norms are for a given online environment with an outcome that many are not so happy about, let's, let's put it that way. And the same is true of anonymity. There's often talk of anonymity as if it was removed from all social norms, but that isn't necessarily true. Anonymity isn't a fixed universal attribute, just like identity isn't. You don't have a fixed identity. We have different identities in, in, in different circumstances. I would have a different identity where there's a coffee shop. Uh, and when you are uh, anonymous, it doesn't mean you're like abstractly anonymous, you're an anonymous within a context. And that context uh, mediates your anonymity and your identity uh, therein, uh, just like identification mediates what you say and how you listen to other people. So again, this can mean uh, fortune, right? Obviously it can mean fortune, but it can also mean a subreddit called change my view where people are very concerned about a highly proceduralized uh, uh, form of debating uh, and uh, inviting challenging people, other people to challenge their views. Uh, and obviously that might not be the silver bullet to a, a polarized world, but it seems like a more deliberative uh, experience that we want to explore. And, and I, what I want to say is, it doesn't seem to make that much sense to take uh, 4chan and uh, change my view as instantiating the same thing just because they don't validate identification. Um, so, and, and 
and, and what, so that's important because some of the conversations we need to have, despite polarization, might be very difficult with identification and perhaps only plausible with anonymity. So my argument is that we need to appreciate what I'm calling, and again, this will go to the multi-sited Helen Norton for, for <laughs> suggesting uh, the plurality of an, the diversity of anonymity. I'm calling this the plurality of anonymity and identification. And my paper tries to start the work of understanding how both anonymity and identification should be gauged for digital public sphere, which means looking into content, moder excuse me, content moderation practices, community norms, content policies, platform affordances, and design. And that's under five minutes, I think. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> um, so I love this paper. I confess it actually changed my mind. Oh. <laughs> uh, on, uh, I, I, I was definitely one of those people who wanted the easy fix of just, you know, get rid of, you know, they, everyone would behave better if we, right. if we put our names to things. Um, clearly the, the empirics and the way you have crafted the argument have made me take a, a big step back. Um, and I, and I, I just say, I have to put on the table I read this paper, you know, over the past week, um, at the same time that I read the, I've got to bring it up, the, the text messages of Ginny Thomas and the actual words right. um, and talk about uh, conspiracy theories um, and, and realizing how um, within a certain community that language and that knowledge was clearly perfectly appropriate and, and how that has really so nothing to do with, you know, whether you're anonymous or, and I just thought that was an interesting um, example to pair with the stuff that you're talking about. Um, here's the question I wanna ask you to elaborate a bit before I open it up to a bigger um, uh, three-way conversation. If I could summarize your research in a sentence, uh, and let me know if I'm saying this accurately, it seems like you're saying that um, content moderation and community standards are much more integral to the creation of a healthy and vibrant debate online that is able to correct lies than anonymity or, re or, or real names, right? Like that, that, that's the content moderation of community standards that have a much bigger role to play in getting us to truth as opposed to anonymity. Is that, let me, first of all, mm -hmm. would that be a fair one sentence characterization? So I don't think it, it has a, a bigger role. I, I would say it uh, defines and is reciprocally defined by, so anonymity and identity is defined by those practices and those policies, etc. So I, I don't know that I, I would say that uh, what has a co more causal effect mm -hmm. uh, is either of those components, but I want to say that, uh, the identity you have in a specific forum in part depends of the content moderation practices in that forum. Great. So if that is the case, do you have insights based on um, your research as to who, who should do that moderating, who should create those community standards, whether anonymity or transparency is um, better suited to the sort of first order uh, right. question of what community standards and moderation policies are we going to um, set up to, to create a space in which we can get to truth more easily? Right. Yes. So that's an excellent question. Uh, and it seems like a, the million dollar question. I had the answer to that. Um, so, so yes, uh, uh, that's something I'm concerned about. And I think the, the choice I had here of uh, uh, change my view might show my preference. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there's a lot to be explored in community moderation, but I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, the only way forward is community moderation. What I, what I think we should be uh, reflecting upon is if, we, if we're trying to build the institutions that will be appropriate governance, governors and that will take those decisions uh, about affordances and design, et cetera, uh, seriously, that might mean we need to look beyond uh, just platforms and corporate responsibility for platforms. This isn't it on this paper, but it's something that uh, I actually pull the thread here to another project. Yeah, no, you can, you can, you can see it. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to ask uh, a, a couple of questions and then really just give it all, give, give it up to you guys to, to get involved. Um, 
And be, I want you guys to interact with each other's papers on just to start with two points. Um, and Joseph, I'm going to put you, you're the middleman. I'm sorry. You're, you're going to, you're going to go against both of these two in my, in my, in my question here. Um, so uh, uh, the, the first is sort of a, a point at which maybe you disagree with Heidi on, at least the paper seemed to disagree, which is what is the role of um, the, the people, the demos <laughs> uh, in creating uh, truth. So as opposed to experts or knowledge producers, um, the role of communities, and this is sort of where our, your, your paper comes into, like the role of sort of lay communities um, in the formation of knowledge. Um, and it's sort of the same, the same question in this direction as well, because um, Joseph, from, from what I understand, you know, you, you put a lot of emphasis on um, the fact that we get, we believe or don't believe these things based on whether our elite of choice is telling us to believe them. Um, and part of what I'm getting from, from arts research is really that, uh, uh, no, there's, there's, there's a lot of power in just normal c citizens interacting with each other in, in these specific spaces, often online spaces, often anonymous spaces, um, where, where that's a place where we uh, actually do engage in our own kind of knowledge production um, and, and, and actually give some credence to age old theories of first amendment law that we are the, 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 the knowledgeable citizen. Um, so I, in no particular order, uh, but it'd be great to hear from all three of you as to the role of uh, experts, elites and um, lay communities as being uh, the, the best creators of the thing that we call truth understanding that truth, um, as, as, as Joseph rightly says, uh, is something that oftentimes is more just the thing we believe as opposed to a capital T truth. Um, do, you want, do you want to start? So, yeah. sure, sure. So on experts, elites, and lay communities, um, I grew up in New Hampshire in the late 80s. And that's when high school started telling me about climate change. And they did this in February and there was seven feet of snow outside. And my friends and I looked out the window and said, what are you talking about? This is completely phony. None of us were particularly political and we weren't really getting, we weren't watching the news. So we weren't getting any cues from leaders. And I guess the expert was sort of the teacher in the room, but we were like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, so there's the lay community, right? With our lay, science oh snow must not be <laughs> must not be climate change now unfortunately well fortunately for me i was like 13 at the time so that's okay we had a senator go and do this on the floor of the senate with a snowball a couple of years ago it's like ah see no climate change so um he, he was in his 50s so that's bad for him i'll excuse my own behavior at the time um unfortunately a lot of people don't listen to experts I think it's 97 or 98 percent of climatologists say, yeah, it's real anthropogenic, it's happening, and we should probably do something about it. Um, but as that consensus has gotten bigger and bigger over time, what has public opinion done? Split, right? Why? Because political elites have done exactly that, split. So they sort of pulled uh, both parties in opposite directions. So Democrats believe one thing, Republicans believe the other. What's the role of experts? Well, I don't think, and, and this is the interesting thing. I mean, Republicans are going against, Republicans of the mass public are going against the experts, but it's not as if Democrats and the mass public are really believing the experts. They're not reading the Journal of Climatology and checking the data models themselves before they believe it. They're listening to Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and their trusted leaders and their trusted groups and going along with that. So, I mean, as, as a professor at a research university, I would love it if people listen to experts more, um, but that's a, a world we don't live in. You know, people trust who they trust. And it's those group allegiances and those allegiances to elites that drive a lot of this, right? Like I, I get asked by uh, election officials, how can we get people to think that we're not rigging this? Nothing you can do, you know, um, because they're not gonna listen to you. 
they're going to listen to the candidates. And if the candidates are engaging in this rhetoric, then um, one side's going to believe it, right? If one of the two of them is doing it. And that's what we have now. So, so uh, Heidi, people don't <laughs> listen to experts. Uh, so why do you want to, why do you want the law to help? And why do you want public funds to go to expert institutions, universities, you know, science communities, all these public uh, knowledge producers that you talk about in your paper? Yeah, well, so first of all, um, yeah, let me say something kind of directly responsive to the sort of what's the point because nobody cares what eggheads have to say. Um, and then I'll um, uh, quickly, I also do want to say a word since I didn't talk about it at all in the discussion. Um, and even in the draft, it's, it's kind of left implicit. A word about the role that the important role that I think um, uh, sort of political forces or the demos, you know, so to speak, through their representatives uh, actually do play, even even in my thinking. So first, why does it matter, right? If nobody listens to the eggheads, um, I think that there there obviously are, you know, there's only so much that certainly that any one force and certainly the government can do or that we would want them to do um, to you know, fundamentally kind of get inside people's heads and, and psychology and change their minds. Um, but what we do have some power over, um, it, at least in terms of the institutions that we can create, including government institutions, um, is the provision of reliable sources of knowledge. And, um, uh, and I think it's, if, if, you know, to put it simply, I think it's essential that those sources exist. Um, and it is, you know, that's only half of the equation because it's true if a tree falls in a forest, you know, if no one listens to them, no one believes them. Um, that's deeply problematic. But I think we're even more sunk um, if we sort of give up on the institutions that can produce uh, uh, sort of reliable, uh, some modicum of reliable knowledge and the disciplines that, that um, are intended to generate them, however imperfectly, um, over time. So it's sort of a, you know, acknowledging this is no panacea, but think how much worse it would be without even, even the sources. Um, I also do want to quickly just say two things that, that came to mind, Francesca, when you first raised the issue of the relationship between kind of the people, what role do they have to play, um, and, and the experts. Um, so even in my thinking where, you know, I, I say, you know, down with unitary executive theory, um, in part, not only because of what I see as deep textual and historical flaws, but that's for another conference um, and another paper, um, but also because of the impact it can have on sort of decimating expertise um, throughout the administrative state. Even from that perspective and from a perspective that would like to see Garcetti um, uh, basically, you know, the court reverse itself on that or at least minimize it, even from that perspective, um, I recognized not just as, as a realism thing, but as a kind of normative good, um, that there is some role um, for politics in all of this. First of all, there's a role for politics in creating these institutions and, and these public employees and funding them in the first place. Um, and also there is a role for politics in their implementation, right? Because at the end of the day, yeah, you might have civil you might have civil servants with some degree of, of protection from arbitrary firing or firing for whistleblowing or what have you. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the top of agencies um, are politically appointed, right? And, and I think some of the value, not the only value, but some of the value in the civil servants or the others who are playing expert roles is in their relationship to the political overseers. Some of the value comes in sort of the push-pull from people who are coming with these different incentives and motivations and orientations, right? You have someone coming from a more policy background, maybe even a partisan uh, background, kind of pushing down from the top. But you also have some pushback um, from those who are coming from kind of a disciplinary uh, orientation. And one, one last thing on this front is that I think one thing that is interesting, I mean, I agree absolutely, Joseph is right, that there is this kind of, you know, down with elites phenomenon that is certainly not new. I mean, it's as old as, as at least as old as the history of the country. Um, but by given that, I think it does say something that 
Congress has and continues to fund and create public institutions. Um, and in fact, you know, oftentimes you will see polls for particular public institutions saying that people, even if they hate the idea of public institutions generally, they love this or that institution. Um, PBS of all things, right, uh, routinely gets uh, uh, kudos from people for being the most reliable news source. Um, and, and I think in some ways, the reason we see these pushes, whether, um, whether in rallies against the deep state or in efforts to pass legislation constraining what universities can teach, I think we do see this kind of implicit acknowledgement that these institutions are understood as, as not just valuable, but as trustworthy which is exactly why sometimes we see these political forces try to harness them and you know, not, not just not get rid of them, but to kind of hijack them and say, okay, propound our message and tell people that message is the result of scientific expertise, for example. Um, so it's complicated, but those are my uh, kind of first few thoughts that come to mind. Well, I guess the, p- part of what you're saying at the end there is the very fact that uh, even those propagating, knowingly propagating in falsehoods are falsely saying that they have science or experts on their side uh, itself might at least show wh- whether whatever the data says shows that there's there's some at least political um, uh, reason to continue to invoke experts in science and and maybe that's 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 something. Um, Art, right, can I have you pick up on again this just this this question? It mostly juxtaposed, I think, uh, you know, with 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 Joseph's work and research, which is, you know, these lay communities. You know, thirteen-year-old New, New Hampshire guy goes on Reddit and it says, you know, change my view about climate change, and 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 is there hope that uh, these these types of communities are actually a really beneficial source of truth seeking? Right. So. I wouldn't want to overstate my claim, and uh, I'm not betting that people will go to change my view and suddenly be more informed and uh, give up on their own old ways. But I do think, and um, that even if it, if it, even if uh, the state of social media is like a nappy phenomenon for for something else, uh, the fact that we have a state of social media that most find deplorable is something that government should be uh, concerned about. And to the extent that those communities uh, like Change My View or uh, other experiments like Chris Bale uh, has signed this app, uh, Discuss It, which is basically uh, uh, founded on on the idea of trying to create conversation uh, uh, enabled by anonymity. To To the extent that that works, it seems like inherently good. If it, even if it doesn't change elections, uh, the fact that we have uh, something that seems healthy on the public sphere, even if people don't change their views, uh, I think should be something we should celebrate. Um, now, on the role of elites, uh, I, this is, that's also interesting. I think there might be more reasons than we would uh, generally admit to a double-blind review, for instance. Uh, so when you are assessing the the work of a peer, and uh, you know you're you're performing your identity publicly, let's say you know there's some some things you might say that that uh, will cost you, uh, and when you're engaging in a uh, double blind review, and uh, you can give an assessment that isn't tied to your to your identity, uh, I think one of the reasons we we might turn to, to, to a double blind review might be that uh, experts are not immune to mm-hmm. polarization and to performing their identities. Actually, I would say that uh, uh, is entailed by the idea that identities are uh, performed for, for, for specific publics. Um, that's great. I think you guys are actually all three in agreement on that, on that last point. I have a question from our online audience, and then I want to um, ask our live audience for their questions. Um, the question is for Joseph. Um, Per historians, Nazi propaganda was effective primarily by motivating those who were already receptive to receiving such propaganda, um, as opposed to convincing others who were not uh, receptive to receive such propaganda. Um, Do conspiracy theories operate in the same way and thus actually do cause harm in the same way by 
yes, they might already have to be receptive, but I take the question to ask, do conspiracy theories like that propaganda push those already receptive into actual harms, into committing actual harms? So the first question would be, who's going to adopt a particular conspiracy theory if they're exposed to it, right? And generally we find that there is a uh, set of motivations that has to be in place for, for someone to adopt any particular, not just a conspiracy theory, but any belief. But in the case of conspiracy theories, they likely have to already be inclined towards seeing the world in a conspiratorial way. So if someone is like, you know, I, I don't see the world this way, I think stuff happens or, you know, these, these sorts of ideas are ridiculous, they're not going to buy in. It's going to take a lot to get them to buy in. And then it has to be the case that they probably already dislike whoever's being accused in the theory. Right. And that's why partisans believe mostly conspiracy theories that oppose the other partisan and rarely themselves. So now you put that together and then you, 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 you wind up in a space where, you know, it's about 25% of the public who will buy into uh, usually any particular conspiracy theory that's partisan mm -hmm. because you have to get just partisans and then just the conspiratorial wing of that partisan group, right? So then, then we found other things that are sort of driving these beliefs too. So what are the types of people that think the Holocaust is being exaggerated or uh, Sandy Hook didn't happen? Mm -hmm. You know, those are sort of antisocial ideas. And it's no shock that we find that the people who buy into those sorts of conspiracy theories, not all conspiracy theories, but those sorts, also have antisocial traits. They're high in dark, uh, um, dark personality traits like narcissism and Machiavellianism and whatnot. So just to get somebody to buy into a belief, there's got to be a bunch of things already going on with them, right? So then the question becomes, well, I was able to convince somebody of a conspiracy theory, but did I really change them in any particular way? Because they probably already believe a whole bunch of other things that are almost the same. They already have the worldview in which these sorts of things are going on all the time. So did anything really change about that person? Right. Um, you know, I'll take, uh, let me use an, an elite for, as an example, if we took the QAnon beliefs away from Marjorie Taylor Greene, is she substantially different? No, because she believes 800 other things that are sort of, <laughs> you know, just as, um, just as out there. Right. And so when people ask me, how do we change these beliefs? for me is take the emphasis off the beliefs because we get stuck in a game of whack-a-mole where if someone wants to believe lots of conspiracy theories and i just keep trying to debunk one at a time i'm you know there's an endless supply that they're going to eventually buy into and i'm just going to waste my breath trying to knock each particular one down so can a conspiracy belief drive someone to act in a particular way sure it can probably focus things that they might have done anyway in a particular way, right? But a lot of times if someone wants to go out and commit violence, they're gonna commit violence and it's just at some point it's gonna happen in some way for some reason. So the, the QAnon conspiracy is, is not the, the, the thing that is prompting Marjorie Taylor Greene to run for Congress or to you know, shoot someone in the street, right? Like, like her, her decisions or anyone's decisions about how to act on the knowledge that they hold of the world is, is much more indep independent as to their priors than um, the conspiracy theory itself. And that is why you don't think that that is where we should locate our intervention. Yeah, I mean, if she, I mean, if you took away QAnon from her, her campaign commercials are still her driving around in a truck shooting things. So, and she still has a hundred other conspiracy theories that she's into. Right. So um, that's the thing. A lot of times we focus on the specific beliefs, but oftentimes it's the people that we got to really be concerned about because there's a motivation to buy into these ideas and there are motivations that would make them act on those ideas. And that's where we need to, so that's where I think we sort of need to get to. Um, oh, I'll let Arco, and then I see Genevieve has a question, but quick response. Yeah, so uh, I'm very sympathetic to, to uh, 
uh, how how you describe this. But so let me see if I, I this is a fair description. Uh, you see those uh, conspiratorial ideas as like conduits for motivations that people might act on uh, had they other conduits uh, in the sense that basically those conspiratorial ideas are, ju are just tools. They could uh, go about, have the same results uh, with other ideas. But while I'm symp sympathetic to that, uh, I think an argument many in, in the audience would make is why not stop that? Why uh, can't we uh, close that, that conduit and interrupt at least that very harmful uh, transmission? Um, so I, I would say this, is that you could stop the transmission. Um, it doesn't mean you're even going to stop the specific beliefs. Because yes, elites can drive this because people l listen to elites and elites have a big megaphone to reach lots of people. But that's not even necessary right? Uh, people were coming up with all of these conspiracy theories on their own. So if they have the worldview, they can see all of this stuff and sort of come up with their own expressions of it. And a lot of conspiracy theories are, in a sense, bottom up, mm -hmm. in the sense that people make up stuff. Somebody came up with the idea of QAnon and, you know, sort of pushing the stuff and other, other people adopted it. But even even as people were adopting it, they already held a lot of the beliefs that QAnon adopted, mm -hmm. some of those specific beliefs. So a lot of this stuff is already out there. People already see the world this way. And even if you get rid of the spread, which is the word that get, gets used a lot, it's not clear that that's gonna stop anything. And I think the danger, the dangers of doing that is you are, could potentially get rid of true ideas. You could potentially get rid of ideas that are not true, but are potentially valuable or could be motivating in some way. Genevieve. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, this is also for Joe. I, I think I find your um, argument very interesting and persuasive, but I wanted to ask you uh, from a different angle about the harms of conspiracy or and how real they are. Um, and so I guess I wanted to suggest that a lot of modern First Amendment law is organized in reaction to fear of conspiracy, conspiracy theorizing or conspiracy, I, I'm not quite sure which, which is to say, you know, much of the sort of modern doctrine, by which I mean the doctrine developed from the 60s on, is a reaction to the 1950s, and in particular to the prosecution of the leaders of the Communist Party of America by the government in the now infamous Dennis case. And the recognition that was shared by a minority of members of the court at the time, but I think is widely understood today, that much of that was driven by conspiratorial thinking. There was pervasive fear among the members of the federal government and prosecutors that there was this great uh, army of insurgency uh, waiting uh, in America to take over uh, the democratic system of government and install a communist regime just like in Soviet Union, even though there was very little evidence to back that up. There was just a lot of fear and the desire to go after the ringleaders. And so it is this, I think, quite significant um, fear of the tendency of government actors to be gripped by the force of conspiratorial or paranoid th thinking that has produced a sort of a very formalist, rigid um, First Amendment doctrine. Um, and so I guess I was curious what your findings suggest for that turn in the doctrine. I mean, was it an overreaction? Should we worry less about conspiratorial thinking of this kind among the elites? Some of your remarks suggest that you don't actually think conspiracy thinking is that uh, dangerous, uh, but the history from the 1950s is that it's suggested, <laughs> you know, at least when um, shared by members of the federal government, it can be quite uh, profound. So one of the theories that came from my first book on the topic is that conspiracy theories are for losers. Now that didn't gain me any favor with conspiracy theorists, even when I said, I mean that descriptively and not pejoratively. It's what I say is usually conspiracy theories, often the salient ones are adopted by people who are out of power, people who just lost the election, people who feel separated from, from the inside. And my conclusion is that that's generally okay, right? Um, because if losers are using conspiracy theories, they're sort of pushing back against a power imbalance. They're trying to correct for a power asymmetry and they're using these theories to essentially perhaps drive collective action, say there's a potential danger from these people who are in power, let's go act on it. 
And if they do it by going out and voting or organizing in meaningful ways, it's completely fine and healthy. And when we looked over the last 120 years, the salient conspiracy theorizing seems to go back and forth as power goes back and forth, right? What really scares me is exactly what you're talking about. Not when it's the losers, but when it's the winners. And, you know, most of what I study is surveys and why the mass public believes what they believe and how they react. Um, but that says little about what I think about people like Donald Trump and others. And there are many others who have engaged in this because when they do it, um, they're able to convince the people who trust them that these things are true and they can drive collective action on that. They can get legislation passed on it and they can act in extremely deleterious ways. Alongside that, I'm incredibly concerned when the powerful use conspiracy theories to attack the not powerful. So when Donald Trump says things like, you know, Mexico is purposely sending immigrants here to rape and murder Americans, that's really bad, right? So, but, but in those cases, what is the source of my real concern? It's powerful people with an authoritative, monop you know, monopoly on authoritative force acting on the, using these ideas, whether they believe in them or not, using them for some political purpose and doing deleterious harms, right? So if you and I were walking around on the street and think, oh, there's communists everywhere, <laughs> you know, we're not, there's nothing you and I can really do about it. Um, but when you get all of Congress acting on it and using force to haul people in front of it, get people blacklisted and whatnot, now you've got a real problem. So a, a lot of my concern was sort of addressed by, I think, some of the other panels, and that is that, you know, government often wants to ban the conspiracy theories of, you know, people like me who don't really have that much influence <laughs> on Twitter, you know, or, or whatnot, and who, who don't really have force behind us. Um, but that's ironic because the biggest dangers with these things are the government when they act on them and use them for their purposes. So who's gonna regulate the government's lies, right? And that was the paper on the panel before mine. So I don't, I don't wanna come off nonchalant and be like, hey, it's just whatever, these theories are fine. Um, there are certain circumstances where they're incredibly dangerous, but a lot of what's happening right now is let's, let's stop the regular folks from being able to communicate their whatever theories to each other. Meanwhile, you have the president of the United States saying all sorts of stuff, so. Great, other uh, questions from the audience? So uh, Genevieve's question, I think, excellently crystallizes what I think is one of the key issues that arises in a lot of these things, which is that there's often a kernel of truth in the case of the communist conspiracy, much more than a kernel. Obviously, there were communist spies. Communists had at the time actually managed to subvert foreign governments. I mean, helped if the Red Army was on the ground, but Dennis talked about the experience of uh, Czechoslovakia, where the communists managed to take over. De um, I think it talked maybe about Klaus Fuchs, the communist spy who uh, passed along nuclear bomb secrets. There was a zone of eminently plausible theorizing, like you could have very reasonably thought there was a lot more going on. And then there was a zone of just sort of opportunistic either lies or exaggerations or just people kind of saying things that they sincerely believe, but if they really only thought a moment about it, they'd realize they had no real basis. Um, so how does one, how does work work that in there? So, uh, or I'll, I'll give an example um, uh, from, from something Francesca raised with regard to things which may, may, may be mixed conspiracy theories and uh, criticisms of particular groups. So, you know, I don't think there is a Jewish conspiracy to run the media, but being a Jew in Hollywood, I happen to know there are a lot of Jews in Hollywood. Uh, so, you, so how does one, if one does want to think through how to deal with conspiracies, deal with the fact that there, that there is this spectrum. Some of them are total nonsense. I'm happy to say that about lizard people, but communists obviously wasn't. Jews in Hollywood, again, 
Not that there's anything wrong with it, but obviously this is something that, uh, that there is an element of, of, of a fact to it. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of the other things. Yeah, let me let me turn to you first and Heidi, because I can't see you. If you do want to chime in after, just just uh, ch chime in vocally and I'll, and I'll give the floor to you as well. Go ahead. So one problem is that people often believe for reasons that have nothing to do with evidence, right? So oftentimes the belief comes first and then maybe they'll grab some evidence later. Um, the other issue is that there is quote unquote evidence for every conspiracy theory out there, even the lizard people stuff. I mean, there's a guy who's written 10 really long books detailing all the evidence that were ruled by lizard people. And to him and his band of followers, that's really good evidence. Yeah, <laughs> well, I've read it. It's not, it's not gonna convince you, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so, and you take every conspiracy theory out there, there's something, right? And this is what you're pointing out. There's something there that if somebody wanted to, to hang their hat on some piece of evidence, they can concoct something, they can connect some dots, they can put a little bit together and they say, well, there's some evidence of this. The question becomes, how good is the evidence? I mean, to me, when I define conspiracy theory, a lot of it comes down to how would the experts look at this evidence and how would they judge it? Would they say that it's true or would they say, you know, we're not convinced that it's true, right? So that's where I draw the line between, you know, why do we call Watergate a conspiracy and why do we call the CIA killed Kennedy a conspiracy theory? It's this notch of experts, right? It doesn't mean that the conspiracy theory is necessarily wrong. It just hasn't met some particular epistemological bar that would satisfy me. And you know, I can't convince anyone to adopt my epistemological bar. Everyone has their own and everyone has several which they apply whenever it's convenient for them. Um, so it's not, so, you know, you're absolutely right in what you're saying. It's just, there's no clear answer to, to that. Just to, I, if I could just follow up real quickly on Joseph's point, because um, I think the point you made about uh, an epistemological bar um, in many ways kind of gets at the heart of, um, uh, you know, one of the key themes of the whole day, um, which is, uh, you know, this sort of epistemological, some would say, I, I think it's true that we're in a, somewhat of an epistemological crisis where, you know, kind of losing our uh, uh, sense um, of a shared epistemological foundation. And I think one piece of that uh, may be nicely encapsulated by a meme that I, I've seen many times over that says, you know, my, my, med my uh, or your Google search is not as good as my medical degree or something to that effect, right? And I think one thing um, that we are seeing and not, you know, and again, anti-intellectualism has a very long history. This is not an entirely new phenomenon. Um, by any means, but um, I think one problem we see with this, you know, kind of these epistemological difficulties is um, an inability on the part of many to, to, to sort of have a theory um, of epistemics, to have, you know, uh, among, among other things like media literacy, right, to, to, to really critically assess um, the uh, credibility of a source um, or to have an understanding, for example, of what science is and the fact that science may change uh, and scientific advice does, may change doesn't mean your guess is as good as mine. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I would, I would say this is not a simple problem by any means and there's no silver bullet, um, but this is actually part of the reason that I do believe uh, uh, knowledge, uh, government sort of knowledge producers and knowledge institutions and the integrity thereof um, have really important roles to play in part for their potentially educative uh, function. Um, well, then I, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege for a second and ask a question that I think might wrap up and bring together uh, a lot of the day, um, which is the, the phrase, <laughs> the marketplace of ideas, um, something I, I think we all still unfortunately say and teach all the time. Um, and, I'm, and I'm giving away my, my, my own position when I say unfortunately, um, but I think we've heard so much today about the, the fallacy uh, of this concept, about the um, unhelpfulness 
of this analogy of the speech ecosystem, the information ecosystem being a marketplace of ideas. Uh, we've heard about how historically that's not how it has worked. We've heard about, um, you know, from, from a behavioral science perspective, that's not how it has worked. We've heard about all, many ways in which the law should intervene in the marketplace to create, in fact, a much more um, uh, efficient and productive exchange of information. Uh, uh, but you all are pointing to um, extra governmental um, sources, uh, whether it's just you know communities or knowledge producers, although public, uh, uh, you know, they are in, they are independent uh, public knowledge producers uh, by Heidi's vision, or um, you know, just pushing back on the fact that we, we we don't want government really getting involved in regulating conspiracy theories. Um, it seems like you all, in some implicit way, are uh, uh, agreeing and staying with the concept of a marketplace of ideas being, uh, as Eugene reminded us, not the only solution, but the best solution to sharing information and arriving at truth. Um, each of your proposals and each of the things that you are talking about really does still aim to try to improve the quality and the number of ideas in the quote marketplace. Um, in light of everything else we've heard today and in light of everything else we know about, again, I'll betray my position, the, 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 the fallacy that that is how knowledge works. Um, maybe you could each say a word about uh, this concept as it relates to your thoughts, um, as it relates to what you've heard today uh, as a way to bring things to a, to a close today. Um, Art, let me start with you uh, and then Joseph and then Heidi. Yeah, I, I was thinking maybe I would uh, come out with a concept like, oh, no, 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 we should have like marketplace of identities. That, <laughs> that was settle it. Um, so I think uh, from, from, from my project, what I could offer as, as in response is, uh, I think the fallacy is uh, the notion that people will rationally uh, uh, grab onto those the best ideas will will prove themselves uh and people will be able to notice that uh and uh, many people have pointed out that uh there are other factors uh uh impacting how people do pick out the ideas they they believe in uh and i think identity is is uh, uh an important component of, of that uh and i don't know that that um I would offer an, an alternative uh, uh, philosophy uh, for the First Amendment, but I think uh, that for those thinking about alternative philosophies, thinking about the relation, I think the, the point here is that uh, now that we, ha we have these digital, digital contexts, identity is much more plastic and you can have a conversation uh, with affordances that you couldn't tweak uh, before. And maybe we can use that to our advantage. Uh, so in, in, in terms of the public's beliefs in conspiracy theories and probably misinformation too more generally, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that things aren't worse. <laughs> the bad news is that they've always sort of been bad. And having been polling the public on all sorts of weird, fringe, probably completely false ideas for a decade, um, it, it does get to me with all the things that people believe that really aren't true. So when you have a pandemic upon us and, you know, 15% of the public says, yeah, spraying myself with Lysol is a good way to cure my COVID. Like, that's not good. You know, so, and, and I, I could go on to, to worse and scarier and, and probably some ideas that we would, um, think are fairly dangerous. I mean, consistently I'm getting almost 20% of the country thinking that the Holocaust was faked or that Sandy Hook was faked. It's not good, right? But it, it, it seems to have always been there and it's a part of the human condition. And it's easy to blame some exogenous force and say, oh, it's Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook that's doing it to us because it, it's easier to sleep at night you know, especially when we have family members who might believe these ideas, they're, oh, well, they're getting it. They're, they're just looking at the wrong Facebook page. We don't want to blame them. We want to blame something else. 
but it's it's them. <laughs> it's us. It's part of humanity. I mean, we all believe all sorts of things, and of course, none of our beliefs are conspiracy theories, but I'm sure they probably are. Um, and and that's going to remain the same for a long time. And I'm sure there are some big solutions we can undertake. I think the the speaker who talks after me, I think the idea of having more media literacy and, and more more uh, training and scientific thinking and critical thinking can help, but we're not going to change humanity <laughs> with a law, you know. Um, so, so I, I I will leave it there. Keep 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 well, the marketplace for now. Heidi, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So re real quickly, um, first, uh, you know, in terms of why the appeal of the marketplace of ideas continues, and part of it, honestly, I think is psychological. It's an incredibly appealing idea, um, but beyond that. Um, I think there's actually a sort of a rational reason for its continued resonance uh, or more rational reason, despite all the evidence to the contrary, uh, as to how the quote unquote marketplace really works. Um, and, and I think that comes back to actually the negative free speech theory. Uh, it seems only appropriate to end with a, with a citation to Helen as well, since I mentioned, many have mentioned her today. Um, but I, you know, I think Fred Schauer is right when he suggests that, that, that the real appeal of this, among other theories, kind of lies in the lack of a good alternative and our fear of kind of a centralized truth decider. Um, so I think a lot of the appeal is it's a way to rationalize um, as a positive good, something that's more based on our fears of the alternative. Um, I will say, and this gets back to what uh, Joseph was just saying, that as you know, as it relates to my own thoughts about uh, public knowledge producers, um, yeah, I you know, I, there is no magic wand to change certainly human nature. At the same time, I think there there is some positive good that government could do um, in terms of putting some of its largesse um, behind, as it actually has done, um, behind uh, uh, knowledge production and fostering critical thinking through education. Um, but I think it is essential to prevent uh, such institutions from just becoming more vehicles for conspiracy theorizing, et cetera, and, and, and partisan politics. Um, to sort of conceptualize these institutions as having some uh, independence protections. Um, that, that's great. Well, I will wrap up uh, this incredible panel. Thank uh, all the panelists for their insights. Um, and it, it is somewhat bleak to end on this note, but I think somewhat hopeful um, that, that the sum total of this panel, I think, has identified uh, the importance of independent institutions, independent thinking, um, safe communities as, you know, three extra governmental areas and spaces that um, have had some hope of, of um, creating, uh, a, you know, a, a, a journey to truth. So uh, I will leave it on that helpful note. Th thank you to the panelists.